We're going to look at the revelation of God in Acts 17. Again, please stay standing as we read the Word of God. Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 16. And if you didn't bring a Bible with you, uh, there are many around the room. You should be able to find one. But we're going to continue our study in Acts, in Acts 17, starting at verse 16. And I'll read if you'll follow along. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you for this sermon of Paul's that we have the privilege of reading and studying and contemplating. We need your help in understanding it. We need your guidance in applying it to our lives. God, may we so appreciate your word that we live it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our study of Acts, we've been watching the gospel move from Jerusalem out into the world. 
And recently, we've been looking at how the gospel went into Europe. And as we've been looking at the gospel, we should remember what the gospel is. The gospel is this mind-boggling good news that God has provided the way to have a forever relationship with Him through the life and death and resurrection of His only Son. And this gift comes from God's grace alone through our faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, we should also think about how the gospel moves. The gospel moves through people telling this good news, just announcing it, proclaiming it, preaching it. And this is called evangelism. Where do we start with people who know nothing of God, nothing of His church, in this whole area of evangelism. Where do we go? How do we start? Sometimes we meet people who have had experience in a church body of some sort and perhaps they left at some time in their lives and they took a, a hiatus. And if we were to share with them things about Christ, things about the Bible, the things might come back to their minds. They might remember them. But more and more I am finding, and you probably are as well, people who are an open slate. They don't have experience. They don't know anything about God's Word. They have heard of Jesus, but they don't know much about Him at all. Where do we start with people who have no knowledge of Jesus or God at all? This message that Paul delivered at the Areopagus gives us an answer. Start with creation. Start with creation. The world in which we live, this beautiful world, the mountains, the rivers, the valleys, this beautiful world is not a shield that hides God. But it is actually a reflection of the Creator. The Creator's majesty and existence is seen in creation. It reflects who God is. And the unbeliever may choose to deny that, but he or she is simply denying what they know to be true. During sleepless nights, when people look up at the stars and wonder how it all came to be, they are simply living out something that God built into us. Augustine said it 1,700 years ago, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in Thee. This passage that we just read is known as the message at Mars Hill. And there's a background to this message. And in one way, the background is 17 chapters long. But real quickly, just to bring us up to speed where we are getting to Acts 17, 16. From a human point of view, Paul has been on a missionary journey and it hasn't been going very well. He went to Philippi, ended up in jail. He went to Thessalonica. His preaching caused a riot. He ended up in Berea and found some diligent studiers of the Bible, but he was forced out of town. Before that, he had been kicked out of Pisidian Antioch. He was stoned in Lystra and left for dead. And so this trip hasn't been going very well. And so after Berea, Paul's friends kind of sent him on a Caribbean cruise kind of trip to Athens. 
And as you jump back to verse 14, you read that the brothers immediately sent Paul on his way to the sea. Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come as soon as possible, they departed. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens. Paul is waiting in Athens. Athens, one of the great cities of the world at this time. As you look at the greatness of Athens and you go back in history, you find some of the cool things about this city. Uh, you find that there were some great military victories. They built a great civilization there. There was a democratic city-state. They started a new way of government that is still in existence even today. In fact, some things of the United States government were modeled on this city-state of Athens. There was great literature in this city. Socrates and Plato were philosophers who had an address in Athens. Great architecture was a part of this city. Some of the architecture is still visible in the ruins of Athens today. Art forms reached new peaks. But as great as the city was, she was fading a little bit. Uh, by the time of Paul, some of the shine was off of Athens. Paul had graduated from Tarsus University, and he was a very learned man. He had studied some of the literature that came from Athens. And here he is in Athens with nothing to do, having had a rough time. And if anybody was deserving of a break... It was Paul at this point in life. Had rocks thrown at him, left for dead, riots come up all around him, thrown out of cities. Now he's in Athens. It would kind of be like some of you football fans. If you were on a trip and suddenly a plane landed in Canton, Ohio and you were put on a bus and put in front of the NFL Hall of Fame. And somebody said, okay, you're stuck here for a day. What are you going to do? <laughs> I'm going to spend the day in the Hall of Fame. That was the kind of place Athens was for Paul. All of the great philosophers that he had studied, all of the great literature that he had read was here. But as Paul is there in Athens... It isn't what he sees. What did Paul see as he looked around Athens? He saw that the city was full of idols. The idea of that phrase, full of idols, is that the city of Athens is actually drowning in idols. It's as if there are so many idols that the people can't even breathe. One person writing of Athens says, it's easier to find a god in Athens than a man because there were so many statues and idols and things that people were worshiping all over the place. The list of idols is huge. Athena, Apollo, Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, Bacchus, Neptune, Diana. The list goes on and on and on. And as Paul looked at the city of Athens, he saw that the city was full of idols. He couldn't relax. He couldn't go to a museum and look at the beautiful works of art. He couldn't walk where Plato had once walked and enjoy the history of this great city because he saw idols everywhere. John Calvin, speaking 500 years ago, looked at human beings and he described us as insatiable idol makers. We were made to worship and we were made to enjoy worshiping and when we don't worship the only true God, we find other things to worship. 
Well, Paul saw idols, and he saw Athens drowning in idols. What else did he experience there? What did he feel? It's interesting that oftentimes in the book of Acts, this church history book, we're told about people's feelings. And Luke, in recording the book of Acts, somehow found out about Paul's feelings in Athens. Verse 17, we read, his spirit was provoked. His spirit was provoked within him. Paul felt angry about this. It angered him to be in this great city and to see all of these idols. Paul was aware of what God said in verses like Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other nor my praise to carved idols. Paul loved God and devoted his life to God and Paul was jealous for God. In our, word, in our world, that word jealous oftentimes is a bad word. Oftentimes, jealousy is a sin in our lives. God is often described as jealous. When God is jealous, it means that he sees that something or someone is in the place that he should be in and he knows that that's not good for us. Paul was aware of that. It was not good for the people of Athens to have all of these idols everywhere and it angered him. He was jealous for God. Some of you here are jealous for God. In talking to some of you, you have friends, you have family who you have tried to share Jesus Christ with and they have not listened to you because they have put something else in their lives in the place that Christ should be. And you're jealous for them. You're jealous because God ought to be there and when he's not there, it's not a good thing. Paul saw the city. He felt things in Athens. And he didn't just sit still. In only 17 chapters of Acts so far, Paul didn't sit still very much. He was a a man of action. So what did Paul do? He reasoned in the synagogue. He did what he usually did when he went into a strange city or a new city or a new and strange city. He went to the marketplace He didn't just stay in the religious places like the synagogues. He went to the marketplace and he began to strike up conversations with philosophers. And he ended up in the Areopagus speaking. Now, Paul could have taken a break in Athens, but he didn't. He went everywhere he could to share Jesus in the synagogue, in the marketplace, in the Areopagus. There were philosophers in Athens. Philosophy was the religion of Athens. And Luke goes into some detail telling us that there were Epicureans and Stoics. If you Google the Epicureans or the Stoics, There are pages and pages of information. To simplify it, here's a quote from John Stott about the Epicureans and the Stoics. To oversimplify, it was the characteristic of the Epicureans to emphasize chance, escape, and the enjoyment of pleasure. And of the Stoics, to emphasize fatalism, submission, and the endurance of pain. Now again, to oversimplify. In many respects, we could talk about the Epicureans as being the more liberal-minded of the people in Athens. Looking at pleasure, looking at the things of life, saying, you know, if something feels good to you, you ought to do that. You were made to feel good, so let's, let's enjoy life. If something feels good, do it. 
Uh, whereas the Stoics pretty much said, when something hurts, you need to bear up under the pain. You need to endure the pain. And so the Stoics were perhaps more conservative in their approach to life. But these philosophers were all over, and they composed the makeup of this city of Athens. The Epicureans were, the, were for the most part philosophers of the rich and the Stoics were philosophers that felt that they needed to defend tradition. How did Paul end up speaking in the middle of the Areopagus and what is the Areopagus? Well, while speaking in the synagogue and in the marketplace and striking up these conversations, Paul challenged the philosophers of Athens. They didn't know what to think of Paul and his philosophy. Some called him a babbler. That's an interesting word. It has the idea of chickens pecking at seeds. And the idea of a philosophical babbler like Paul was, oh, Paul, you're just pecking at these ideas. You're grabbing an idea and then just spitting it out. You don't even understand it yourself. You're just like a chicken pecking at things. You don't ever take anything seriously and go down deep into understanding it. You're just a babbler. And as you look at Paul in this respect, um, he became kind of a curiosity to the Epicureans and the Stoics. What in the world was the Areopagus? Well, if you took the Broomfield City Council and you also gave them some legal authority, you'd kind of be getting close to what the Areopagus in Athens was all about. They were in charge of religion. They were in charge of all of the idols in Athens. And they also had a little bit of authority to decide some legal matters. And so somebody like Paul who comes in with these new ideas that didn't fit with the Epicureans and they didn't fit with the Stoics, well, he's got to be dealt with. And so the place to deal with him is the Areopagus. Amazing. Paul is sent to take a retreat in Athens and he ends up in court. <laughs> he ends up testifying and speaking to this great group of men in Athens. Paul saw some things. Paul felt emotions of anger. Paul went out and tried to do something about it. What did he say? Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Paul's message to the Areopagus is a very intriguing message for us to consider because it shows us how we can take our message to people with no background that we can use to share the truth of God. Paul starts with God the Creator. Creation is on our side. I love a quote from C.S. Lewis. No philosophical theory which I have yet come across is a radical improvement on the words of Genesis that in the beginning God made heaven and earth. A couple of months ago, David Shelley spoke on this text and talked about the historical background of the unknown God and a man named Epimenides. Paul did not waste time. He jumped into the deep end and he praised God as the creator. And as creator, God doesn't need us. Idols need men to make them, to fashion them, to carry them around, to put them places. But God is the creator and he doesn't need us. Paul's message continues and he says, 
God is not only the creator, he is the sustainer. One of my favorite passages from the book of Colossians is Colossians 1 verses 15 to 20 that talk about the beauty, the glory, the power of Christ. And in verse 17 of Colossians chapter 1, Paul simply says, in him, Jesus Christ, all things hold together. This verse suggests that if Christ is not holding all things together, everything would fly apart. In Athens on that day, Paul proclaimed God who not only created all things, but who also sustains them, keeps them going. The very fact that we are in the world today, that we are alive today, that we can think about both of those things today, all of that is due to the sustaining power of God. Why doesn't our world just blow up? Because God created it and because Christ holds it together. God is also the ordainer, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling. We don't know the future. We don't know what God has determined in terms of the national affairs of the United States of America. We don't know what he has determined about Syria or Iran or Sweden. But we do know that God is in control of all that happens. He has made plans and so he has determined what will happen in history. This is the true God, not a weak God. This isn't a God that we must beg in order to get him to act. I've read some things about what's happening today in our nation and I fear that some people have a vision of God being a weak God in heaven as if God is at his desk in heaven and an angel comes running up to him. Father, have you seen what happened with the Supreme Court in the United States? That's not our God. Our God's in control. He ordains. Nothing surprises him. He doesn't have to be told about what is happening in his world. God created. God ordained. God holds things together. Paul moves to a point that is significant. We should seek God. Verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Paul quoted secular poets of the day. Paul was aware of authors that had been writing. There was a story told of Homer and the Cyclops. The Cyclops was this beast that had been blinded in one eye. And the Cyclops had to feel around because he was in a cave and only had one eye. Paul uses that same word as he talks about how people should seek God and Feel their way around to him. Feel their way to him. Paul was aware of what the men and the women of Athens were reading. He was aware of some of the popular philosophers of the day. And he said, with this creator, with this sustainer and ordainer who is the God of the universe. Man ought to be seeking him even if man has to be down on his or her hands and knees feeling around trying to find God. But sadly we don't. And so Paul concludes his message 
repent. People of Athens, repent. Turn around and go the other way. Go toward God. You've been moving away from him. The city is full of idols and false worship. Move toward the true God. Feel your way, if necessary, on your hands and knees to the true God. Repent. Verses 29 and 30. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Paul could have pointed to the gross immorality of the people of Athens. He could have pointed to their intellectual arrogance, but he didn't. The Greeks had never been told about this sin before. But this was not the case with God's revelation of himself. Paul said, the creation of this world, your very existence, the fact that you don't fall apart is evidence of God and you should be seeking him. Repent, move toward him now. God has been patient. He's overlooked ignorance for a time. But God commands that we move to him, that we seek him, that we repent. And he's appointed a final day and a final judge. How successful was Paul's rest in Athens, his little break? He didn't even leave a church behind him. A couple of people, it looks like at least four people, believed and turned to Christ. Pretty consistent with what's been happening in Paul's missionary journeys, isn't it? It's rough. He didn't leave a church, but he left a few believers. And we know from history that after Paul's death, there actually was a church established in Athens. What's the value for Calvary Church in 2015 as we look at Paul's message from Athens? As we try to determine what Acts means for us, I'm going to ask you three questions. Luke told us about Paul's situation in Athens. He told us what Paul saw. As you look at our world today, what do you see? What do you see? And I mean, what do you really see? I'd encourage you to go to Flatirons Mall sometime and look around. What do you see? if you go to Flatirons Mall. I'd encourage you when you're gassing up at King Supers, getting 20 cents off per gallon, to look around at other people. What do you see? You cannot, you cannot look at our world and see what Paul saw in Athens. Thousands and thousands and thousands of idols everywhere. We're drowning in them. Just as the Athenians were. What do you see? What do you feel? I don't have to tell you the damage of idolatry. I don't have to tell you what it does to the lives of human beings when they put other things and other people where God should be in their lives. Broomfield, Westminster, Arvada, Lafayette, Louisville, Thornton, our communities are full 
of evidence. What happens when people worship idols? Their lives are destroyed. How does that make you feel? And what do you say? Brothers and sisters, by and large, we have been too quiet. We have been silent in the view of all that's happening around us in our world as we see idols. And even if we feel some anger about those idols, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have been too silent. We have not spoken. And here Paul gives us this model. Go to the creation. Speak of God as creator. Speak of God as sustainer, ordainer. And tell people to seek him and turn and follow him. Why is it that more people aren't being reached? Because we don't see like Paul, because we don't feel like Paul, and because we don't speak like Paul. And when I say these things, understand the conviction that I feel in myself. I live in this country and I drive by idols everywhere and I forget to see them. I forget to feel the anger that Paul felt as he saw lives being ruined. And too often I'm a coward to speak truth and to speak words of truth. This week, thinking about this text and praying through this text, I don't want to challenge you to do something that the Holy Spirit isn't challenging you to do. I don't know what he might use this message to do in your life, in your neighborhood, in the world that you live in. I would invite you to join me in praying eight words this week. Eight words. Maybe even every morning, pray eight words. They're not hard words to remember. When Jesus' disciples saw his life, they saw something different, they saw his relationship with God, and they apparently had had a lot of opportunity to hear him pray. And so one day, we're told that they asked you, hey, Jesus, how do we pray? And Jesus taught them this prayer. And the first eight words of the prayer go like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Would you pray those eight words each day this week? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You see, when you, you, when you pray those words, when you pray, hallowed be your name, you're simply praying that God's word would be held in honor. You're simply praying that God's word would be held in high esteem in the world. And brothers and sisters, before we speak in front of the Broomfield City Council, before we speak to our neighbors, Let's begin by praying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we do confess that 
Were we in Paul's situation, we might have just we might have just gone out by the pool, put ourselves down in a chair, and ordered a soda, and spent some time resting and recouping. But Paul saw things, Paul felt things, Paul did things. And so may we not be complacent, may we not be apathetic, and may we pray each day this week, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's our desire, Father. It's a very basic desire. It allows a lot of room for application in our lives. But God, may we pray that prayer this week and may that prayer be our desire. May that prayer open our eyes. May that prayer focus our attention on people who've put idols in the place of the one true God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Allow us to lift the name of Jesus high where it rightly deserves to be. Amen.